Welcome to Cooking with Dame, everybody. Today we're making Bloody Marys. You're gonna need yourself some ingredients, so make sure you get um, vodka. People, people use vodka. Tomato juice, pickle juice, steak sauce, string cheese, bacon, and a pickle spear. If you're anything like me, you've seen your fair share of hangovers. I need water. Bad hangovers. What did I do? Death threatening hangover. Hey Ma, did you get any text messages? For thousands of years, people have tried to come up with hangover remedies. You got your 6 a.m. morning beer. I used to do that one kind of a lot for people who are employed. I'm on my way, but I'm stuck in traffic right now. There's the shower beer, all kinds of crazy things. Some work better than others. But nothing works like a Bloody Mary because you can't be hung over if you're still drunk. Okay, so now it's time. Let's make the Bloody Mary. Get yourself a glass. Need a glass. I'm gonna fill this bad boy with ice, right? Want yourself a cold Bloody Mary. Okay, this is the king of the Bloody Mary. It's the vodka. We're gonna go two shots. Ooh, that might be too much. Might not be enough, depending on how hungover you are. Full disclosure now, um, this is like the 15th take, so the ice cubes have kind of melted, but let's just pretend this is full of ice. The next step, and this is a secret ingredient, is pickle juice. You're gonna wanna have a third pickle juice. Next secret ingredient is steak sauce. So we're gonna put the steak sauce in with the pickle juice. It's a good amount there, yeah. Full disclosure number two is I bought a pre-made Bloody Mary mix. You're gonna wanna use just like a regular tomato juice, I think, but whatever. We're gonna just drop that in there. Now it's time for to get the garnishes ready, right? You got your string cheese, poke that bitch through there. Little pickle, put that through there like that. And then your bacon. Get your little bacon in there, like that. Drop that into your Bloody Mary. Give a little mix. And there you go. It's Damon's Hangover Killer, right there. The Big Dame Hangover Killer. I think, is that what we call it? Yeah, we do call it. Big Dame's Hangover Killer. And that's it. Hey everybody, welcome to another new and improved episode of the Low Budget Show with Damon Millard. I'm Damon Millard. We're new and improved. We have both video and audio. And it's in color. Can't really beat that. On today's show, we have music director, vocal coach, Jivey. You're the next guest on the Low Budget Show. <laughs> he stops by. We talk about religion. Oh, sweet. Musicals. I love the idea of a competition musical. Cooking. Sure. Circumcisions. Great idea. You're going to want to stay tuned for that. It's sort of a hero's journey. Also on today's show, we got viewer mail. Did you write me a message? You could be on viewer mail. You won't know unless you stick around. You didn't send me anything? Well, you can. Get a hold of me. It's Damon at DamonMillard.com. Or just uh, put a little comment right in the comment section. Roll up. Type it in there. What you been up to? You doing that dog training? Because your dog's actually an asshole, I hate to tell you. Your dog bit a mailman, and uh, now it's going to be murdered. I hate this chair, you guys. Look, look at what I did. I got this little chair with the these arms on it, and I have to sit like this. Did you tell anybody about the show? I would love that. We're at 193. 193 subscribers. Seven away from the Philly Cheesesteak Party. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell icon, and share with your friends. Awesome, you guys. I'm down to, like, my final two 
Coca-Cola coffees. Remember days I talked about these on a previous episode? Can't find these. I have a feeling that Coca-Cola is going to discontinue these. You got to go into the deep hood into like the most dangerous neighborhoods to find these. Like the other day I was, I was driving by a store and there was a bunch of bullet holes and I was like, I bet you they have Coca-Cola coffees. And they did. I only have a few left. What are you guys doing over there at Coca-Cola? Am I in focus? There, I hope I'm in focus. All right. That's another improvement. Most of the show is in focus. They're really good. Tastes like Coca-Cola, then a big old wave of coffee. They're not even a sponsor, and I'm fully endorsing them. If anybody works at Coca-Cola or knows um, how to get a hold of one of the executives at Coca-Cola, tell them not to discontinue the Coca-Cola coffees. Hey, if you think this is bad, wait till viewer mail comes up. It's Thanksgiving week. You guys got any plans? Me and my girlfriend, we're going to go to a soup kitchen and hand out uh, turkey dinners. No, I'm kidding. We're going to go to OTB. We're going to bet on the ponies, kid. I like Thanksgiving. Can't remember having a good Thanksgiving as a child, though. I don't remember us having lights on all the time. What are you guys thankful for? I actually wrote gobble gobble here. This was my little note to myself to talk about Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble. What's up with this chair? What is going on? Uh, did I say anything funny yet? Do you like the Thanksgiving Day Parade? What, like, what is that? I'm suspicious of people who like the parade. It's just like, what amusement are you getting by, like, bands walking past you, you know? So weird. I'm not gonna lie, I like a good float. It's too commercial though. It'll be like, the Heinz 57 ketchup float. It'll be like a big bottle of ketchup, dancing to like whatever hip hop is happening right now. Break dancing, ketchup and mustard. Heinz, get, get your, your motherfucking, motherfucking Heinz, Heinz up, up in, in here. here. I don't know. Are you guys seeing this? Are you seeing this? Here. Keep cutting myself shaving. I went two decades where I was a normal shaver and now every single time I, I, boom, 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 boom. I thought it was maybe I got a bad batch of razors so I went and I bought some new razors and I just, I still do it. I'm, it's every time. Can you forget how to shave? Is that what's going on? You guys got any uh, shaving tips? Uh, leave a comment, let me know about that. I had this eye twitch for like six days. It's just going away, so I'm scared to talk about it, actually. I want to jinx it and have it come back, you know? And then when it wasn't there, I was like, is it happening right now? It's like I had this paranoia that it was just going to be forever. Is this even a show? Talking about cutting myself shaving and eye twitches? Are people tuning in for that? No, they're not. Just doing my best. You guys been paying attention to the dog saga? A couple episodes back, I was telling you how my dog jumped off of a bed and broke her ACL, or the dog equivalent of an ACL. Whatever. ACL. It's a CCL. Thank you. And um, she had to go in for surgery, $5,000. What they did is they took out the knee bone and reshaped it and put it back in. And it's like, is God slipping? Couldn't design a dog right? Anyway. She's been trying to recover from that, and she's still limping, and it's taken much longer than they told us. And now, my dog is suicidal. And she's like, I had enough of this. My dog's fucking eating all kinds of poisonous shit on the street. Any powder, syringes, gobbling them up. Gobble, gobble. I'm wrestling razor blades out of her mouth, some random stuff in the hallway. My dog just eats it up. So my girlfriend wants to make sure it's not poison, so she eats it. The fuck? I, I don't I don't know if this is poison or not. Then for the rest of the night, she's like, I think my arm's numb. My arm is numb. She's actually my girlfriend's dog, but I invested a little bit of money during the surgery, so now I own a part of her leg. If we ever split up, it's going to be a weird court battle. Also, I wanted to tell you about uh, my new job. I started bartending recently. I never bartended before in my life. This job just landed in my lap. I live right around the corner from this bar in Brooklyn called Old Keefe's, old school Irish bar. There's a little room upstairs. Three years ago or so, I sent them an email and I was like, hey, you ever wanna do a comedy night? Let me know, and they got a hold of me. And I've been doing um, a show there for years now. It's a lot of fun. So we shut down for the pandemic. And then when the bars opened back up, the owner calls me and he goes, hey, Dane, I want to talk to you about your comedy. And I was like, yeah, 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 what's up, dude? And he goes, have you ever thought of being a bartender? 
oh, come on, man. Hurtful. I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And it's fun, but I have zero, zero bartending experience. I don't know anything. Owner was like, don't worry, no one orders anything complicated. And for the most part, they don't. For the most part, the ingredients are the name of the drink. Jack and Coke, vodka tonic, you know what I mean? Very simple, but every once in a while, somebody will come in and order something complex, right? You know, instead of telling people that I don't know what I'm doing, what I'll do is I'll fake like I'm getting a text message while I'm actually Googling how to make it. And then I'll be like, oh, it's my fucking baby mama. Come on, man, it's supposed to be my weekend with the kids. All right, Bay Breeze, Bay Breeze. Vodka, orange juice, cranberry, got it. You know what I mean? So there's that. On the last episode, I was talking about bartending. I always record way more than I can squeeze into an episode. And it's mostly because I'm nervous I'm not doing well. I'm almost never doing well also. And this is a story that got cut out. But, uh, so this lady comes in, right? She comes waddling in. Beep, 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 beep. She's wasted. She looks like a spilled beverage herself. And she fucking somehow gets up on the bar stool and she goes, do you have driver's ed? I go, driver's ed? Yeah, do you have it? I go, driver's ed? She goes, yeah, driver's ed. And I look around and I was like, no. And she goes, not even a wet one? I go, no, we don't, we don't have wet driver's ed. I was like, this place could be full of it. And I, I just don't think I could serve you. And she goes, that's fair. And, and she leaves, right? And the whole time there was these two girls next to her. And I go, she wanted driver's ed. And they go, no, she said, drive rosé. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. That's a more reasonable thing to ask for at a bar. Time for viewer mail. This is the part of the show where I, I read the messages that you send to me. Here we go. Our first message. Our first message comes to us from Rebecca in Buffalo. Rebecca writes, Damon, what's your favorite kind of music? That's a good one. I, I'm, I'm eclectic. I mostly listen to one-man bands or anything Norwegian. Oh, here's a fun fact. At night, I can't sleep with complete silence, so I'll listen to like relaxing sleep sounds like thunderstorms or city rain is another good one. But there's an option on the Alexa app for keyboard typing. What kind of fucking straight up psychotic DMV employee needs that to go to bed? That's what I want to know. Do we got any more messages? Oh, cool. This one comes from Roberto. Thanks for all your tips about making Bloody Marys. That's in this episode. It didn't even come out yet. I don't know how you did that. Do you make any Latin cuisine for Thanksgiving? You know what, I actually do. Turkey mole. Not a lot of people know this, but I have a trademarked turkey mole recipe that was handed down from my great grandmother. And we do that every year. Mashed cauliflower instead of potatoes because we're all low carb. All right, that's enough. Um, you got any messages for me? Send me a message. Damon at DamonMillard.com. But if you just got a comment, put them in the uh, comment section below. That's going to do it for this portion of the show. Thanks for sticking with me. Tell some friends about the show and uh, let's head on over to our interview with Jivey. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Low Budget Show. And joining me now is my buddy, Jivey, who is a music director and just a music genius. Would you accept the term genius? No. What about uh, Savant? That would imply I'm still young. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dame. Okay. Hey, thanks for welcoming me in, bro. Yeah, for sure. It's good to be on set. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one, right? Can you comfortable? Can a quick little clinky? Clink a ching. Awesome. I really like that cooking with Dame stuff, man. Yeah. So cheers to that. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I wouldn't exactly call myself a cook or anything, but uh, have fun with it. Are you a cook at all? You cook anything? No, but I married well. You did? Yes. Talk about that. She's like freaking restaurant quality cooking. Nice. It's insanity. So it means when she's got the TV on in the background, it's almost always on a cooking or food channel or yeah. something. And the musician in me gets so torqued by those host voices. 
Oh, like, yeah. Like, dude, that southern cooking lady, I can't stand her, the sound of her voice. Which one is it? Ray Drummond. Nice and messy. Oh, she's the one, the, the pioneer lady, right? Yes. Oh, I hate Brilliant her. Brilliant recipes. Anytime my wife does them, they taste amazing. But I can't stand Oh, I hate that she's like, voice. I have a surprise for you. The whole show is like monotone. Her skin and her hair and the background are all the same color. I dug it when the One Network started realizing, oh, we need to put a bunch of our successful chefs in the same room. Yeah. Like that type of show makes it, a, like at least you get the banter, the round table stuff, you know? I guess, I'm not into any of that stuff. And that's the thing, like my girlfriend loves that, all of that stuff. All the reality shows, Bachelor, Bachelorette, she likes Housewives. I'm into Adult Swim, I love Mike Tyson's <laughs> mysteries, you know what I mean? Wow. I like uh -huh. I like superhero stuff. I'm into that. We both compromise and so when we're watching TV together, we're always watching something that neither of us really <laughs> wants to watch. Sure. Sure. Dude, and like my nephew now, yes. like all he cares about is watching YouTube channels. <laughs> And most of that stuff is Japanime. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So your wife's the, the cook in the house. Wife is the cook in the house. I could barely even microwave a hot dog properly. Oh man. Well, why don't you keep you around then? What are you bringing <laughs> to the table? Well, shit. <laughs> Shouldn't have to pause that long. <laughs> um, fuck. I need to get used to being the weakest link. <laughs> I guess I should tell you that I have my degree in classical piano. Yeah. Back in the late 90s, I did graduate as an Indiana Hoosier with my piano performance degree, man. Nice. And moved back to where I grew up in Phoenix after that and just started working immediately, teaching and accompanying and playing for the choirs and the musicals. And, you know, I've been working with actors since I was 14 or 15 as a vocal coach and band leader. Nice. A head accompanist and support. And, you know, now that you've, we've worked on Broadway, it's just, you know, been like, I guess there's nothing like accomplishing the dream that you had when you were a little kid. Right, but how, where'd that dream come from? Probably like seeing Paul Schaefer on David Letterman. Really? Yeah, cool. if you go like all the way back, like yeah. seeing that guy having the ability to hire that caliber of musicians to sit with him five nights a week and play like weird, out of the blue, interesting ins yeah. and outs from every commercial and when every guest came on and this was the most kicking band and like that band leader had not only a piano but like the organ on the one side and a few other keyboards in his own little like zone and I was like I want to run a band from where I can have that kind of a setup and that kind of a cool zone. I have zero knowledge in, in your world. So I do work mostly on new musical theater these days. Since that classical piano degree in the late 90s, I've done a hell of a lot of different jobs, but despite all the different bands I play with and artists I support, you know, I got a big passion for like, what are the next kinds of stories get, that are going to be told on stage live going to be like you know because live performance is never going to go away it's part of what makes us so human right you know and for a huge s amount of people of which you're not one that's almost like a religious experience for them to all be in the same room while the story is being told you know, I think that's why a lot of people buy tickets to go see their favorite band. Yeah. You know. Yo, I mean, my favorite band is Led Zeppelin, and the best stuff is all those bootleg live albums, and you're just like, holy right. shit. This sounds nothing like on the studio release, you know? Have you ever been to see the uh, female tribute band, Les Zeppelin? No, I haven't. I saw one in Vegas called, like... I think it was Black Dog, maybe they were okay. called. Okay, uh-huh. They were, they were pretty spot on, but they needed like two guitarists. Sure, you know, To like sure. carry that weight. So my old neighbor in Hell's Kitchen is the drummer for Les Zeppelin. Oh. And she's uh, a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Um, only noticed me because she was attracted to my dog, Fred, yeah. the Basset Hound. Don't be fooled by the name. It's actually a her. Yeah, you can visit this social tag. She was like, can I give your dog a part of my pastry? 
Yes, you may. And now it's ruined for her mooching the human food. Oh, yeah. A bunch of her life, she was like zero human food. Happened with my dog, too. I, there was a moment in a hotel room after a show. Uh, we ordered pizza. My buddy is passed out on the couch with like a pizza on his chest because he was just like eating pizza off his chest. <laughs> and, uh, and then the pizza box spilled on the floor. And I was like, do you mind if I give it to Cindy? And my girlfriend was like, yeah, I guess so. Fine. And ever since then, we've, we've woken up a monster. That, is that how Fred is? Yes, insanely. Um, right now, my mother-in-law is living with us. Yeah. And if she and my wife are sitting on the couch like you and I are, mm -hmm. Fred will be up in between them. If they each have a dinner plate, Fred will absolutely go yeah. boom, right there. Right. <laughs> what you gonna do? So yeah, one of the big challenges in new musical theater, I, I'm super passionate about it, but for the last 15, 20 years, they've been making movies into musicals. It's sort of become a thing. And like, especially you've seen Disney come in and grab a huge market share. Right. Like they have Disney shows in a percentage of the Broadway theaters. I have this idea that some of the m movies that cater to us ought to be made Broadway musicals. So you want a spitball? Oh yeah, okay. Clockwork Orange, the musical. That would be a pretty imposing score, right? Yeah, it's yeah. already got. It's okay. already pretty music driven. Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite, the musical. The musical set in Idaho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was the name of the llama he had? Tina, you fat lard, come get some dinner. I mean, you know, Lafonda's got to have a big number, oh, right? Oh, Lafonda. I'm Lafonda. The Low Budget Show, the musical, could be a pretty good one. That would be amazing. Submit that to your Fringe Festival, man. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you'd go that far. No, I'd take it to Fringe, right? I, I don't know if it'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, everything I touch is genius. So. <laughs> That's one of the songs right there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Everything I touch is genius. And then we tap Everything dance. I do is totally cool. Yeah. Something like that, you think? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Did you grow up religious? Oh, man. Really fundamentalist. Oh, wow. Oh, like wow. Like hearing, like, you know, thus saith the Lord. Oh, thou shall not. And all that. Certainly the Ten Commandments Verily and keeping the Bible very, very literally interpreted. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot that kind of led me to start making the choice to work as a musician at a, a diverse array of faith areas. Yeah. You know, and whether that was supporting High Holy Days or playing at an Episcopal church or playing at a Methodist church or a Baptist church. And in my family itself, not like I said, my mom's side of the family was a long line of Assemblies of God preachers, but my family itself, we worshiped at some non-denominational independent style churches growing up, you know, but there was still the crazy shit, the swinging from the rafters, the speaking in tongues, the three or four hour church services, the clean your pastor's house. You know, certainly like people expected to give their 10%, which I know that you get a tax deduction on and all that. Yeah, the tithings um, or whatever. Right, and you're giving that money to God, but you're really giving it to the property and the people that are running that organization. And if you believe that God is in and of everything yeah you know if there's a supreme thing you've got to look at it like as i think you can nutshell the whole bible into god is love yeah yeah that's a pretty succinct yeah. way and so then if you say well what is love you know and you have to like be able to find a way to get love imbued into all the matter you know i think i can navigated common ground with people from a really broad array of faiths and just say, look, can't we agree? Yeah. Like, if you can find love in any matter in the universe, yeah. you know, you're going to find God there or whatever you define that higher power as. You're high as shit right now. Yeah, <laughs> duh. <laughs> I kind of also steer away from like, yeah, I don't know. Me and God got our own little thing going and I don't, I don't really need to be showing up places on certain days of the week. 
Yeah. Like, my folks definitely took pride in Washington about how great our personal family faith was. Okay. That ended up being the reason we moved from Washington to Arizona, is that the church leader got kicked out of his National Council of Church Elders and received a subsequent vision from the Lord oh. to move his flock to Scottsdale, Arizona. Really? That's bonkers. Dude. 1987, I'm 10 years old. I go from climbing trees in Seattle to 122 degrees in the summertime. Wow. I'm just, I'm, I'm amazed that someone could be that into religion that they would change their entire life and follow a man to a different state. It's uproot their whole lives. 100% dad, we got to talk about this. This is bonkers to me, to be honest, but I mean, I've heard of weirder shit, I guess. Literally, my folks lasted in Arizona in the church for three years, and then they were off finding a new home base. But I will tell you, after eight months of going to different church every Sunday, yeah, they settled on, on the foothills of Camelback Mountain, in Paradise Valley, Arizona, a Jews for Jesus church. <laughs> All right, that's a lot of to unpack. So I'm, at this point, a 13-year-old young man hanging out at another independent, non-denominational church. Oh, not, yeah, but did and, you get uh, circumcised? Well, I think that happened when I was still, okay. you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mine's growing back. I'm proud of you. Thanks, man. So you're four-skinned? Yeah. Twice? Well, like, no, halfway right now. Just through okay. sheer willpower. Just. Uh, are you doing the weight treatment? No, no. You know what it is? I don't use it a lot, so. Oh, the retreat. <laughs> yeah. Have you gone to any black churches? Like, like, did you yeah, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Black churches are fun, dude. Super great. Okay. They are having a good old yeah, time in there. Yeah, hundred percent. Yo, I thought it was crazy because then they break out the slip and slide, and you're like, "This can't be church." That's normal, man. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. It. We're having fun, aren't we? I'm having a blast. Good. We Tell don't have more. to talk about the Jesus freaks too can, much, but it's interesting stuff, though, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. What was like your first instrument? Oh, dude, I got up at my elementary school talent show and like rocked the piano after just a few months of lessons for, you know, like a thousand people or something. And hearing at, oh. you know, age, I, I can't have been more than six or seven. Yeah. Super young, but hearing like a thousand people clapping. Yeah. In whatever that cafetorium was back in the day. Oh, that's so cool that you knew exactly what you wanted at six years old. Yeah. Uh, my mother has said a, a hundred times that I was really changed that day or I seemed that I was hooked that day. I fought musical training. I hated piano lessons. I'll tell you when it changed for me that I finally bought in. Freshman year of high school. I was ready to give up on piano. I was good at it already, enough that they were grooming and saying you should be looking for more opportunities to keep doing this thing. I hated classical music. I hated trying to read the sheet music of the songs I loved by artists like Led Zeppelin. Right. I'd like be like, I'm gonna play these notes on the piano. It doesn't sound like it. There's, there's something more than just the notes, right? There's right. Like a soul when you go to do also. the graphic layout of what the music should be, notationally, yeah. there's a lot of information to get across to get all the soul of whatever's in that song. Especially once music started getting recorded, and then they were releasing popular music song books. Yeah. Me as a kid who knew how to read all the masters notation wise right i would go to buy the billy joel songbook and it would be the wrong key from where he recorded the song or oh, wow. it would be missing the introduction to piano man <laughs> all these things in the notes that just wouldn't line up fast forward i'm ready to quit lessons at age 15 I'm campaigning for student government, putting up posters after school. And the new teacher at the school stops me and says, some of my students said you play the piano. I'm the choir director. I need an accompanist. Oh, wow. 
Would you be willing to change anything in your schedule to play piano for one of my choirs? And I looked at my schedule and said, yes. I would love to get rid of my typing class. Not even like coding, typing. Nice. This F, F, Yes, F. Yeah. yeah. Get your words per minute up, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of kids don't have to do that nowadays because no. they're fucking, it's just like a, well, another language. to the old guys. So I got into accompanying the beginning women's chorus that was at the only hour that my typing class was off. And once I realized that my piano skills were valuable to that many ladies in the room at a time, I was hooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like bringing my choir songs to my piano teacher. I was like, I got to get good enough to be really good for these people. And that school had like seven or eight choirs. I went on to do all the all-state choirs, the all-state show choirs and jazz choirs. And yeah. learned how to play in a band, learned how to back up singers, learned how to lead singers. Cool. Learned how to be a singer a little bit, although I don't do that a ton. I have to demonstrate these days right. as a music director when I'm showing a musical cast of actors what this new work is about. I got to be able to sing a thing. So you took like your skill of piano, basically, yeah. and then you learned how to do all this other stuff, and that like kept moving you. Right. You fast you. forward to the pandemic and I'm managing some new musicals that their progress is shut down. I don't have to go into a studio to do a session anymore. That's good. I can session from home. I can, you know, send my tracks for somebody's song to them from my home studio. Yes. Yeah. Is this a development through like necessity of the quarantine? Or? Necessity of the quarantine and you, you know what it's like to start with the really crappy gear and yeah. get your oh, self yeah. built up to where like the two shot looks better. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Shout out to um, your darling's glassware. Yeah, this is good. That's Thank cool. you. I think I stole that. Pretty sure. So did you ever like put a band together and just go out on, on, on tours or stuff like that? Or like, what was your genre? You are like trained so you could play like Beethoven and all that shit. <laughs> but what was your like true genre, like rock? So I graduated college in the late 90s and I was a little bit stuck. I have this classical degree. I've been working for seven different theaters and churches of different denominations and it's looking unsustainable to keep that kind of diversity rolling into a lot of income in, in yeah, yeah. the Southwest. After a couple of years, I started working with a production company that was doing special events, corporate events. Um, Arizona is sort of a market where a lot of companies will take and do their employee retreats because there's golf courses and there's a lot of hotels with convention space. I started a band doing stuff to cater to a multitude of different corporate events. Oh. Smooth enough to play your dinner music. Spice it up for a cocktail hour. Weddings? You ever do weddings? Dude, we were Arizona's number one wedding band five years in a row. Hell Shout yeah. out to the instant classics. What's some of your favorite wedding tunes? Oh, dude, what do you think my favorite wedding tunes are? Fools Rush In. Close. Back That Ass Up. Obviously, shout out to Juvenile. Right. Yes. Wouldn't you give it up for a little bit of ABBA? Dancing oh, yeah. Queen. Yeah, you've got to have that. You have to play Dancing Queen, don't you? Dude, you've got to play My Girl for the father of gotcha. the bride, don't you? Right, you got to do that. White Wedding. That's funny. <laughs> That's about a that, shotgun wedding, that, right? That caters to a certain type of married couple, doesn't it? It sure does. The Instant Classics also helped premiere the concept of live band karaoke, where anybody could get up and rock with the band, and we would know 300 to 350 songs and have the lyrics on stage for you and support singers to help get you through the thing. And it's like so silly, man, but it worked out great. And that band, I shit you not, made over a million bucks in less than four years. Whoa, holy shit. And they're still together to this day. Wow, dude. Hell yeah. Why'd you, why'd you quit that then? 
that band took me to New York for the first time in my life in 2007. I was already 30 years old. My first time in the city was to play a corporate event at the Waldorf Astoria. Oh, dude. And so I go down with the band. These are my bandmates in the Instant Classics now that we're traveling with, okay? Right. And our drummers from uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. And so he's like, hey, I haven't been to Times Square now in years. Oh, yeah, turn this direction, <laughs> you know? And we get to the hotel and I walk in. It's gigantic, it's three floors. Um, with the opera boxes all the way around, and I realize this is the stage where they used to do the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame awards induction ceremonies oh, really? every year. Super legendary hotel ballroom, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then they roll out the nine foot Baldwin piano. And I realized that was used on the awards when Ray Charles played it, or Billy Joel played it, and every one of the staff members could not have been sweeter, kinder, more normal and natural to me. So you play this concert there, and you're like, I want to be here? Is that, is that what brought you? hundred percent. I woke up the morning after the gig before flying home. Um, and I was walking on the north side of Grand Central Station, um, and an old gentleman stopped me and said, son, you've got really great style. And I, w I knew I had to live here. It was like a tractor beam. Yeah. And then you were like, Fuck, I'm back I'm to, to back to work 200 days a year with the cover band in Arizona. And I knew that playing 200 nights a year in Arizona was going to continue to not be New York City to me. And after time, it was not enough following dream. I totally get that, man. It took me five years from that time, from that gig date, um, till when Katie and I were able to move here. Right. And now, right. like, we're, we're like, 60 days from celebrating 10 years. Congratulations, my man. Thank you, man. Uh, battery's running out, so this is perfect timing. Thank you so Great. much for joining me. Uh, also, tell some friends about the show. That's it for the Low Budget Show. I want to thank you guys for joining me, and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, that's it. Goodbye. Thank you. What were we talking about? The Low Budget Show with David Millard. I still love you. That was the best. <laughs>